So it, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I will try to tell you a story. The data is still early, and I recognize some people in the crowd. Um, the data is still early, but I'll try to tell you the story and to make the case for using alternative ways of finding new drugs for kids with autism. So most of you work with autism, and there is nothing new about this, but just to remind you all that really we're dealing with a disease that has, is so pervasive that affects multiple aspects of brain function and non-brain function, right? So yes, DSM will talk about social communication deficits and repetitive behaviors in whatever configuration they're gonna do it for DSM-5, but the majority of the kids that we see in clinic come because of irritability issues and immune instability issues and ADHD-like issues, um, sensory motor issues, GI dysfunction, sleep problems, um, immune dysfunction, epilepsy, and so on. So we truly have a pervasive disease, a multi-system disease. And so the idea that any drug would ever address autism is a little bit unrealistic. Having said that, if you look at what we typically use in clinic, none of the drugs that we successfully sometimes use have come through the translational route. So what we have done so far is we have looked at these domains we are assuming that these domains are similar in neurobiology to similar domains that exist in other disorders. So let's say repetitive behavior, autism, and OCD. We're assuming that they're on a neurobiological spectrum. And therefore, if a medication works in another disorder, it must work for autism. And this approach has worked sometimes and failed multiple times. <laughs> The truth is, as most of you know, you can get to a, same, to a symptom domain very many different routes. And so the idea that we can map one-to-one -one, um, phenotypic observations to neurobiology is probably false. Having said that, there are domains where this has worked, uh, most notably irritability aggression. So uh, atypical antipsychotics are the only drugs that have an FDA indication for something that's associated with autism. We have decent data for the stimulants for, for the treatment of ADHD-like symptoms in children with autism. They don't work as well, and the side effect profile is a bit worse, but it's still a decent option. Um, the, re the repetitive behavior domain is where we got a little stuck. So we had all made the assumptions that if SSRIs are useful for OCD-like behaviors, that they would also be useful for repetitive behaviors so associated with ASD. We invested millions and millions and millions of dollars in two very large multi-site trials. One is out, the Selexa study that you may have seen from last year, and the other one was a pharma-sponsored fluoxetine study, and they were both completely negative, flat. Placebo line and active drug line are on top of each other. So then the question is, is it true? <laughs> Um, and if it is true, what does it say about us borrowing drugs from other disorders and assuming um, neurobiological spectrums where phenotypic spectrums exist, right? And there are some issues with that, and we can talk about it later. There is all kinds of problems with how we conceptualize repetitive behaviors in ASD and whether the concepts are the same, the constructs are the same between OCD and autism. And we may have been very naive about this, but the truth is it is a wake-up call that we it is time to start looking at what the basic science tells us, what the animal models tells us, tell us, what genetics tells us, and consider the possibility that in fact we do have molecular targets to go after for development of new drugs. So I will make the case for oxytocin today. It's probably not the best example of translational research, um, and I'll tell you at the end why, but it's still kind of an interesting possibility. Oxytocin is a 9 amino acid peptide. It's synthesized in your hypothalamus. Um, there are separate neuronal groups that do systemic release versus CNS release. Um, and it looks like CNS release is important for social communication, bonding, and trust. And I'll show you a couple of um, those examples. Um, so just to give you an idea, and you don't have to read this slide, this is just to give you an idea that there is a plethora of animal studies, as mouse and rodent studies among them, that have shown that oxytocin is important for social recognition and social processing in the animal species, in, in, across animal species. So 
central administration of oxytocin will facilitate social memory. You can block this by giving an oxytocin receptor antagonist. Um, transgenic mice that lack the oxytocin gene uh, have social recognition deficits, and those are not due to learning problems or olfaction because mice use olfaction for social recognition. Um, if you take an oxytocin knockout and you administer oxytocin intracerebrally before they see a conspecific, you can rescue actually the deficit, and so on. I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, this is just a, is that a, yeah. This is kind of a, one of the classic experiments from about a decade ago. So. This is your oxytocin knockout mice, not the oxytocin receptor, but the oxytocin peptide knockout mice. So if you introduce a new mouse into a litter, um, they will spend a certain time sniffing each other to get to know each other. Every time that you introduce the same mouse to the litter, they will spend less and less and less time sniffing the other mouse because now they recognize the mouse. It's a familiarity, um, social recognition and familiarity uh, paradigm. But if you take the oxytocin knockout mouse, uh, they spend the same time sniffing every time you introduce them to the, lit to the litter, suggesting a social memory and social recognition deficit. There is also a lovely, lovely naturalistic experiment. Um, there are voles in nature, and there's multiple types of voles. Um, but it turns out that although they look identical, they have this quite a variety in their social behaviors. So you have the prairie voles that are monogamous. They take care of their young. And they even have preferential relationships in the leader, kind of a friendship proxy. Um, and then you have montane and meadow voles that actually are fairly promiscuous, don't take care of their young, and so no preference for um, mates in the litter. And the only difference between those types of moles is in the distribution of oxytocin and vasopressin 1A receptors. By the way, oxytocin and vasopressin are sister peptides. They're very similar. They're very close um, um, on, on the chromosome, and they just have one amino acid difference. Um, and the vasopressin 1A receptor has similar functions to the oxytocin receptor. And then you can actually um, induce maternal behavior and pair bonding by administering oxytocin to these voles, uh, even in the absence of mating, which is a requirement usually for pair bonding um, in, in, in this species. So there's just, this is all to say that there is a variety of information from across animal species to say that oxytocin is likely very important for social recognition, social memory, and attachment and bonding. OK, now do we know it's interesting data, right? So the question is, what are the disorders in, in the human species that have social recognition, social memory, and social at and attachment deficits? And autism is not just one. It's not the only one. So you can think of the negative phenotype of schizophrenia. You can think about social anxiety. You can even think of some personality disorders that kind of have some of those features. But autism seems to fit fairly nicely. And so then the question is, do we know anything about oxytocin in ASD? And we know a little bit. And even that, we can discuss it after. We're not quite sure whether we want the oxytocin system to be abnormal in ASD or not in terms of therapeutics. But we can talk about this after. But we know that there are decreased blood levels of oxytocin in autism. And there is an absence of normal developmental increase with oxytocin, uh, in oxytocin with age in autism. So there seems to be some kind of developmental abnormality with the maturation of the oxytocin system in autism. What it means exactly, we don't know. Because this is a large peptide. It doesn't readily cross the blood-brain barrier. And we don't know what the correlation between CSF levels and blood levels are. Um, there are multiple genetic studies now that have found associations with either the oxytocin receptor, the vasopressin 1A receptor, or the oxytocin and vasopressin peptides. Um, and then there is some very interesting data around gene expression. So there were a couple of um, cases of uh, mutations in the oxytocin uh, peptide in the oxytocin receptor genes, where the kids had phenotypes that included autism. And so based on that, uh, the group in Duke started looking at temporal slices and also blood levels to look at methylation pattern, uh, patterns of the oxytocin receptor gene. 
and they noted that increased methylation of the CPG islands that regulate oxytocin receptor expression in the peripheral blood uh, was up in, um, in autism. So they were hypermethylated, basically. And the finding now has been replicated by the Toronto group, by Rosanna Wexberg. It's not out yet, as far as I know. So there is, this is to say that there seems to be some var uh, variation in the oxytocin uh, receptor gene sequence and expression in autism that may or may not have uh, significant implications for social function. So, so far we have animal model work and early genetic studies would support that aspects of the oxytocin system are involved in social cognition and function. And it raises this possibility whether we have a potential for manipulating that system to improve the symptom domains that seem to be core to the disorder, namely social cognition, social function, right? Now there is a lot of debate about whether we want, again, this system to be intact or not. So we started thinking, great, we have a genetic linkage, great, we have lower levels of oxytocin, it must be involved in the pathophysiology of the disease until at least in a subgroup of kids with autism. But the truth is, if it is really dysregulated in, in autism, chances are by us giving oxytocin, we're not gonna get what we think we're gonna get because it's not an issue of more or less. If you remember the experiment of the voles, the differences in the distribution of the receptors of isopressin 1A and oxytocin. So in some ways, we would hope that if it is dysregulated, it is not too dysregulated so that we can actually manipulate it. Now, problems. Oxytocin is destroyed in your gut, so you can take it as a pill. We have two options. We have IV oxytocin, which is pitocin, and it's a very large naturalistic experiment because pretty much every woman this day gets pitocin during labor. Um, and then there is this, uh, a series of intranasal compounds for oxytocin that used to be on the market in Canada and in the US. In fact, this was a very commonly used drug for breastfeeding because it, oxytocin facilitates milk letdown in women. Turns out we were not, North Americans were not too keen on using oxytocin from breastfeeding. And this was not a financially profitable market for Novartis. So Novartis pulled the drug out of the North American market, although it is still available in several countries in Europe. It was not a safety issue, it was a financial decision because it didn't seem to fit with our cultural values on this side of the pond. Now, intranasal oxytocin sounds like a good idea, but there are significant problems with it. And the main, main problem with it is that its half-life is in the minutes. So somebody should, have, somebody should say that we should have stopped here, right? And probably we should have, uh, except that the surprise was nice. So there was no good reason to actually go down the route of drug development with a compound that has a half-life of minutes, right? And the other problem we have, other than it's a large peptide and very little actually crosses the blood-brain barrier, the second problem we had was that we don't have a PET ligand. And therefore, the usual steps that we use for drug discovery, which is, this is the compound, these are the levels in the blood, in crosses blood-brain barrier, this is the affinity for the receptor. These are standard steps for drug development. We cannot actually do them for oxytocin at this point. Again, this is to say, we should probably have stopped at that stage, but we didn't. And the results were a little bit surprising. So I'll show you a couple of, a few of the single dose studies that were done with oxytocin um, to show you that in fact the effects, the behavioral effects are clearly not in the minute. Okay, so this was the original DOME study. <coughs> this is a classic paradigm that some of you may know, very controversial, but it's out there. Um, it's called the reading the mind in the eyes task. Uh, you only get the eyes and you have to decide which of the four emotions match this expression. It's pretty hard. Any ideas with, what the right answer is? Panic, yeah. So, this, this is basically the task, um, and it's hard. People, there's no, there are no ceiling effects in the general population. Uh, there are plenty of lower effects in uh, affected populations. So uh, Dom Santal took 30 healthy controls between the ages of 21 and 30, and administered a single dose of 24 international units of oxytocin versus placebo one week apart, and the order was randomized. This Kids, basically, because they were students, they were undergrads mostly, 
uh, had no access one disorders. They denied any substance abuse. And they started testing 45 minutes after administration, remember? So this should be at the much after the half-life, in theory. So you should be seeing nothing at this point. It was supposed to be a fatal flaw of the study. So if you look at the total items, <clears throat> you have much better accuracy in the oxytocin group versus the placebo group. These are healthy people. They have no deficit, right? So this is a trend at this point. But the task gives you the ability to separate hard from easy items. And so if you go to the hard items, because this is a healthy control group, um, you get a very nice statistically separ significant separation between the oxytocin trial and the placebo uh, trial, with the oxytocin trial having much increased accuracy in emotion detection. It was interesting, right? But still, because the half-life was so short, we were all thinking that there's something wrong with this experiment, right? There's no way that you're getting effects an hour, an hour and a half later if the half-life is a few minutes. So then the second study was an fMRI study, actually. It's an emotion uh, matching task. So you have to match the emotion of this person with one of the two faces in the bottom. There were 13 this was at the NIMH. There were 13 par uh, participants. They were all young adults. Again, no axis one, no meds, and no substance abuse. They got a slightly higher dose of oxytocin. And then 30 minutes after, so again, past the half-life point, um, they started their fMRI scan. And so there's all kinds of ways to discuss this data. But the basic point, if you want to look just at the first column, is that you had decreased activation of the amygdala in response to fearful faces than compared to placebo. So this was interpreted as an anxiolytic effect and possibly a social anxiolytic effect because it's a social stimulus of oxytocin. The other thing that they noted was that there was decreased coupling between the, your amygdala and your midbrain in oxytocin versus placebo, suggesting that the automatic response that we have when we're scared, uh, that kind of sends input down to our spinal cord for us to either run or freeze or whatever we're going to choose to do, was decoupled. Again, suggesting an anxiolytic effect of, of oxytocin. OK, so people are starting to get convinced that there must be something to oxytocin that is not mapping to the half-life construct, that there's something else going on. So they're starting to play with this compound a bit more. This was, now we're still in healthy controls. We haven't touched any population that actually has a social cognition deficit. So in the next Australian sample, they took 52 healthy controls between the ages of 18 and 28. It was, again, a single dose placebo control challenge about a week apart and the usual dose of 24 international units. And they looked at the time, this was a passive paradigm where people looked at faces. They had an eye tracker and they looked at the time spent looking at eyes versus looking mouth versus looking at the rest of non-social aspects of face and room and you know picture. So you will note that on oxytocin, people already orient to eyes much more than they orient to placebo. They orient somewhat more to mouth than they orient on placebo. And on oxytocin, they spend la much less time looking at the rest of the face and picture than when they were on placebo. So there seems to be, in typically developing people, a shift towards oriented to the social meaningful aspects of the face when you're on oxytocin versus when you're on placebo. Now, if you think of the, of the animal paradigms, there's nothing about emotion recognition and all of that in animals, right? It's all about recognition, social recognition. So people thought that maybe face recognition was a better translational paradigm for oxytocin than the emotion recognition piece. Mm -hmm. And so again, another single dose placebo controlled challenge with oxytocin with 36 volunteers in young adults. And you will see face identity memory uh, uh, improving somewhat, uh, half an hour post-administration of oxytocin, and some maintenance of the effect 24 hours later. 24 hours later, nothing about the half-life of this compound can explain this, right? So whether this is a social learning phenomenon, where for whatever the time of exposure to oxytocin was, there was actual social learning that was maintained the next day, or whether there's something else going on in the brain that has nothing to do with a half-life in the blood, we don't know. 
but the effects seem to be lasting 24 hours later. So then the question was, okay, in typically developing people who do not have social cognition deficits, you can see an enhancement of social function, social cognition with a single dose of oxytocin. What does that say about populations that actually have a deficit and can we observe the same phenomenon? At the beginning, we had no access to the intranasal oxytocin. We still don't, but both Health Canada and FDA now have given us permission to import it from Europe. At the beginning, we didn't have that luxury. So the original studies were done with pitocin, straightforward pitocin, pitocin drip, as you would get if you were in labor. I know, it was not fun. So um, this um, was before my time at the Mount Sinai lab. And it was a, an IV infusion of pitocin over four hours. And the goal was to study repetitive behaviors. Now, I have some issues with this paradigm, and I'll tell you what the issue is. But basically, you can see on oxytocin over the four hours, you get a nice decrease of what they labeled as repetitive behaviors versus placebo. So you get a nice separation with a pitocin drip in the reporting of repetitive behaviors between the two challenges. Now, this is my problem. What they used for this paradigm was the checklist from the Y box. Do people know the Y box? Not everybody. So the Y box is a measure of, rep of repetitive behaviors that was developed for OCD. So it has typically OCD-like behaviors. And it's comprised, it has two parts to it. It has a checklist with all kinds of behaviors that you can go in and check the ones that are relevant to your patient. And the second part is a severity measure. So what they did in this study is they took the checklist and they asked some of the items of the checklist over a four-time period. The one problem I have is that the, the way we ask the questions for the Y box is, was this a big problem for you over the past week? So they've been asking this question over four hours. So to me, it's not clear that this is a reduction in repetitive behaviors. It's more like in their perception of what their repetitive behaviors have been. So for me, it's more like an anxiety, general, more generalized anxiety phenomenon than OCD. But again, I'm not, I'm not clear. It was reported as a reduction in repetitive behaviors at the time. Of more interest, this was a social paradigm that was done with an IV infusion. And so what we did here is everybody came in, they got their infusion one day, um, they came back to, uh, between one and two weeks later and got a second infusion. One was placebo, one was oxytocin. And the paradigm at the time was a homemade paradigm of uh, affective prosody. So different sentences of neutral content were read in different emotions and the participants had to identify the emotion of the sentence. So it is emotion detection from, uh, from sound and not from face, uh, not face detection. Okay, not face emotional detection. So everybody got better during the, inf the infusion, suggesting some kind of learning effects for our paradigm. But when they came back, people who were exposed to oxytocin had maintained the effect, where people who were exposed to placebo had to relearn it. And this was statistically significant. Again, giving us some suggestion that maybe there are some social, le social learning effects involved in here that have nothing to do with how long the half-life really was and what, what, whether at that time of exposure your oxytocin levels are higher or lower, but that at the time of exposure there's some kind of active social learning process happening. Okay, the Australian group went back. Australia always had intranasal oxytocin, so they were in a much better place to do this and picked up 16 adolescents with ASD. And they did the same reading the mind in the eyes test with the adolescents now with ASD. So you will see that on oxytocin, they have much better accuracy in emotion detection than on placebo. Now on the hard items this time, this is autism, everybody crashes, right? There's just no way to get around it. But on the easy items, you get even a larger statistically uh, significant difference between the two, suggesting that some of the phenomena observed in the typical developing people that have to do with emotion detection are probably true also for the ASD population. Now, this came out last year, and it was particularly interesting. And I know it's a busy slide. I'll, I'll walk you through it. Give me a sec. Um, the problem we have had so far is that most of the paradigms are fairly simple. They're emotion detection. They're not theory of mind, they're not real life social cognition paradigms, right? So the French group, this group is from Paris, decided to do a true theory of mind task. And this is the task. 
it's a computer game, and the person thinks that they are playing with three other people, and they are playing a ball game. There is a good partner, meaning that this partner sends the ball back to them all the time, or most of the time. There is a neutral partner, which means that this partner sends the ball back equal time, equal, with equal frequency to all three partners. And there is a bad partner that basically never sends you the ball back if you send them the ball, right? Now, the healthy subjects very quickly, so this is, um, this is uh, the good partner, this is your bad partner, and this is your neutral partner. So the typical people very fast learn that there is a good player there, and they play with their good player, so they can get the ball back and forth. In fact, to make it even more inciting, uh, they got money uh, based on how many times they got the ball back, right? So there was real drive to actually figure out who the good player was. People with oxytocin had no clue. People with ASD had no clue. They had no differentiation between the good, the, good, the bad, and the neutral player. It was random throwing the ball back. They didn't figure out that there was a good, a bad, and a neutral player. But when they got oxytocin, you start seeing, again, the typical pattern emerging with them figuring out that there is a good partner and preferentially returning the ball back to their good partner. Does that make sense? So it seems that there were actually improvements in theory of mind with oxytocin in this group with a single dose of oxytocin. By the way, talking about the half-life issues, this lasted hours. So nothing about the half-life would explain this, OK? The other thing is that um, there were some, after this task was done, so we're talking about a couple of hours later, they were asked, they were shown faces and they were asked to kind of do a gender identification task, but that was not the point of the task. The point of the task to see, to, to look at how long they're looking at face versus out of face in the picture. And you'll see the same phenomenon that we have discussed before. So on oxytocin, they spend much more time looking at face than out of face. And on oxytocin, they spend much more time looking at eyes versus nose and mouth versus the rest of the face. So again, they're replicating this effect for preferential orientation to the social meaningful aspects of the face. OK, so, so far, it seems that single dose of oxytocin will do this social orienting and kind of provide some social savviness in people with autism. But this is not a clinical trial. This is a single dose. It doesn't tell us very much, in fact, about whether there is therapeutic potential to the compound. It tells us more that manipulation of the system in whatever way is probably good in this population. The main issue we still have is that this is a large compound. It's a large peptide. And uh, so li very little of it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier, although some does. Um, and that it's intranasal. And not everybody likes intranasal administration. I mean, you can think of your kids with autism who have sensory issues. Not everybody tolerates liquid being you know, snorted up their nose. So um, it is not an ideal formulation. The, the whole point of drug development is to get down to small molecule agonists, because those very readily cross the blood-brain barrier. You can package them on pills and all kinds of other formulations. And, and they tend to work well um, across disorders that uh, need blood-brain penetration. Now, there are a couple of companies that are working on this. I just want to give, I put this up to just give you a word of caution. We don't, because we don't have a PET ligand, we don't actually know that all of the effects that we're seeing from oxytocin are the direct res result of receptor binding. And this is important because if we get a small molecule receptor agonists, there is no guarant agonist, there's no guarantee that the effects that we're going to see are the same with oxytocin. And in fact, Wyeth put out this paper for one of their oxytocin and, uh, agonists that did not show the full range of behavioral effects in the animal model as straightforward oxytocin. So obviously, we all want to see a small molecule agonist. But this is to say we shouldn't stop by doing to do work with the real compound, because it may actually end up being the case that we need the full peptide to get the effects. And, and it's not clear yet, because we don't understand the full biology of the system. OK. So, so far, I showed you the single dose studies. And, and at some point, we figured it's time to do a pilot project.
And there are all kinds of differences between single dose studies and multi dose studies. Single dose studies have no effect, they have no problems like steady state levels, uh, side effects, receptor down regulation, all the kinds of problems that we get with drugs when we administer on a regular basis. So unless we test it like that, we really don't know whether it's promising as a compound for therapeutics. So what we did is we did a pilot study. It was an intranasal oxytocin study that we imported with our first FDA ND waiver. Uh, we exposed 20 adults with autism, half to oxytocin, half to placebo. They were again young adults. Diagnosis was clarified and confirmed, and we gave them BAD dosing. And what we decided to do, and again, that's another issue with oxytocin, right? Because the half-life issue, we don't know what it means. We don't know how to dose it. So what we decided to do is to give one dose in the morning and one dose at lunch. And the reason we did that is because if you look at the behavioral data, we were at least getting behavioral effects about three hours later. So we figured we can cover some of their social interaction times by giving them oxytocin at morning and at lunch. Somebody can argue with this paradigm and they would be right. There is no justification beyond our best guess. So that's another, <laughs> so really there has been no dose finding study. The problem, the reason we're stuck with this dose is because the fMRI studies, and I showed you one, but there's a couple now, all use 24 international units. But was that based on any science or just a number? I think it was based, they just went from the animal model and they adjusted up, um, which is not a good way to do this. Um, but the problem is because now we have behavioral effects and brain effects with the 24 international units from the single dose studies, we're kind of stuck with this dose. In theory, somebody should go out and do a proper dose finding study, but we have to be convinced this is the right compound to be putting all the effort in before this happens. What's the Are you? So those international units. International units. Intranasal. Okay. Yeah, so it's okay. So it's intranasal, it's the compound that Novartis makes that we basically imported from Zurich. That's what we did. Um, okay, these are our measures for the pilot study. So we had some social cognition measures, and I'll show you some of those. We tried to do social function, although there is a paucity of measures for social function for clinical trials in ASD. Some repetitive behavior measures, and I'll show you a couple. We measured irritability, and then we measured quality of life. And the quality of life is actually a very good lesson. I'll show you the data in a second. I had no intention of including a quality of life measure for a six-week study. Um, IRB, REB made me do it, and they were right, and I'll show you. <laughs> All right, so DANVA, anybody knows the DANVA? No, social cognition task out of memory. It has three subtests. One is emotion detection, and it's a series of phases where you have to identify the emotion. Um, one is a paralanguage, uh, paralanguage task, like the one we had uh, done for our um, infusion study. So neutral sentences read in different emotions. People have to identify the emotion. The last one is a uh, um, body gesture task, where basically a person takes a makes a gesture and then they black out the whole body and you have to figure out what the gesture is. It's, it has really poor psychometrics actually and we dropped that subtest. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> this is, uh, it has an adult battery and a kid battery for faces and we find that the kid battery is much more sensitive to change than the adult battery. But basically this is what it, lo it looks like and the instructions go, I'm going to show you some people's faces and I want you to tell me how they feel. I want you to tell me if they're happy, sad, angry, or fearful, scared. And the paralanguage task, as I said, it's neutral sentences, things like, I'm going out of the room now, but I'll be back later. But they are read in four different emotions and then the participants have to identify the emotion. Okay, the SRS is, uh, people know the SRS? It's a parent report. Um, it's normed theoretically in the general population, and it measures aspects of social symptoms and social function in ASD. And then we use the CGI, and we always use the CGI, and it is your clinical judgment about whether a patient has improved or not. Repetitive behaviors. So the Y box I explained before, this is a measure that was developed for autism. 
uh, and it is a parent report and it has those uh, subscales that actually kind of try to pull out the constructs apart f that are under repetitive behaviors. <coughs> because we have too many measures, as you can tell by now, this is a pilot study. We created um, two constructs, a low order repetitive behavior by adding those two subscales and a higher order repetitive construct, which is more like OCD, by adding those two subscales. At the time it was intuitive, now we have done a factor analysis to confirm that. So it's, it's, it's probably a valid construct. And then we used the World Health Organization quality of life and we focused on emotion, emotional psychosocial uh, health. Okay, data. Reading the mind, oh, we did have the reading the mind in the ICE task, um, but everybody else has been finding effects. And lo and behold, six weeks later, we have statistically significant separation between the placebo group and the oxytocin group and a huge, huge effect size. Now the DANVA, um, we have some moderate effect sizes, but we have a problem with it. We got lots of ceiling effects. It's much easier than the reading the mind in the ICE task. So we're getting improvements, but the truth is everybody's scoring in the normal range on the DANVA for the adults. So there's not much room for improvement. In terms of the CGI social, our odds ratio is 3.4 for improvement in um, oxytocin versus placebo. And we have a small to moderate effect size on the SRS. Remember, this is a six-week study. Eh? It's a very short study. Trends are as important as anything else. And in fact, I would urge you to ignore the significant p-values because it's 20 people over six weeks. It's more like the effect sizes that are probably important in this story. Okay, repetitive behaviors. Nothing on the Y box. Completely, completely flat. But if you look at the repetitive behaviors, higher order versus lower order, we have a very nice effect size for, for lower order repetitive behaviors, which is surprising. We don't have many things that work on lower order repetitive behaviors in autism. Um, this is an interesting thing. We don't know what to make of it. Basically what happened is the active group did not change at all while there was a placebo response. So either it's a random thing or the active uh, compound got in the way of the placebo response, which would be worrisome. And there are naturalistic experiments where this may have happened. So that's why we're a little bit worried. So pregnant women, when they give birth, they have a huge surge of oxytocin, and they have kind of a transient OCD-like phenotype. And people have uh, developed, uh, explained this as an evolutionary phenomenon because women needed to keep the area clean and the baby taken care of and risk-free and all of that. And so we have a little bit of a concern, this is too small of a sample, that although the lower order repetitive behaviors may be getting better, there may be a tendency for OCD-like some of the OCD-like behaviors to get a bit worse. So we'll have to see that, we have to explore that. The big, big surprise was this one. Quality of life on the psycho psychological health, we had a huge effect size. Very nice separation between the two groups. Almost unrealistic effect size for quality of life. And what people reported, which was your question, was a feeling of well-being. So this was patient-reported? This is patient-reported, this is ad these are adults, and they're all self-reporting and they were reporting this feeling of well-being. And we're not quite sure, they were very upset that the study was over and they had to come off of it because it's not available in North America. So um, we're not quite sure what that means. <laughs> we're not sure if this is an anxiolytic effect or whether there is an actual facilitation of the reward system that's happening with oxytocin that may be supported with some of the animal model work so that there is an actual enhancement of reward of everyday interactions. It's all good, although everything that's good can be bad, right? So again, we have to explore this phenomena. We don't like people to get addicted to good feelings. Uh, messing up with your reward system can do bad things to you. Um, so we're not sure what it means, but people had a feeling of wellness on the drug compared to placebo. Okay, side effects. Again, 20 people, so with a grain of salt. Placebo was a disaster, actually, I have to tell you. Um, there were all kinds of side effects in the placebo group. <laughs> so, I mean, it reminds you why you need randomized control trials. Um, fatigue, increased mood lability, persistent cough. This person, his tics got so much worse that he actually dropped out of the study halfway through. 
he was clenching his, uh, his jaw and was chattering his teeth, and it was just horrible to watch. We had to drop him from the study halfway through. Um, worsening social withdrawal, and this is again a reminder that the formulation in this disorder counts for something. This was a person who got their, I, I always had them take their first dose in front of me to make sure it went well, and this person got a full panic attack from the sensation of the liquid going up their nose, and they never had a panic attack before. So formulation counts. Active group. Um, a couple of people got a little bit, so irritability, there was no improvement, no worsening overall as a mean, okay? But there were a couple of people who reported worsening irritability. And again, we can make biological stories about why this could be plausible. So all of these things need to be followed up in a bigger study. Um, what they called increasing allergy symptoms, which we have interpreted as an international formulation problem. And then there was a person who was on seizure medications, had a seizure disorder, and his wife thought that he was staring a little bit more. And just to be safe, we dropped him. We are not sure if that was true or not. He had no metabolic abnormalities at the time that we dropped him, and there was nothing to kind of explain increased frequency of uh, uh, staring spells. OK, so now we have a pilot study in adults that suggests that the effects are not limited to a single dose and that it's potentially promising that multi-dose oxytocin will have therapeutic value. But we're still very early on in this story. So what we managed to do is get a grant funded by the Department of Defense in the United States <coughs> to do a two-site study of intranasal oxytocin in adolescents with ASD. We have uh, both Health Canada and FDA approval at this point. It's a two-phase study. We're doing some dose finding in the first phase. Um, it's not true dose finding. So what, what we decided to do is just deal with maximum tolerated doses, um, and we, but we're not exceeding the dose of 24 per weight. So Health Canada would have liked to see, first of all, there's a couple of issues with Health Canada that I'm learning now compared to FDA. They are very rigid in their Okay. in their ideas of um, how pharmacology works. <laughs> and so they had us adjust for weight, and we have no evidence that this is the case, that we need to adjust for weight. But uh, we're adjusting for weight, and then we're doing a dose finding, a maximum tolerability dose up to 24 international units or whatever your adjusted dose for weight is um, in adolescence. And, the, and we're, measure, we're measuring all kinds of stuff. So the one thing that you may have noted is that the choice of measures for the pilot study, there was room for improvement. And it's just that we didn't know, we don't know that any of the emerging social cognition measures actually are sensitive to treatment. So in this first phase, we're testing a whole battery of social cognition measures. Everything from emotion detection to theory of mind tasks to strange stories from England to more in Dennis's task from Toronto to anything you can imagine. And we will pick the ones that are most sensitive to change for the second, f second phase, which is a randomized control trial, which we haven't started yet. Um, we're also exploring the anxiety effect because we were not sure what this well-being construct was. Um, there is some concern from the animal model for amnestic effects, which are supposed to be good. And some people arguing that um, part of the reason women who give birth um, don't exactly remember the nature of pain that they experience during delivery is because oxytocin actually, the oxytocin surge produced some amnestic effects that have been seen in the animal model. I, I'm not sure what to make of that story, but basically just to be safe, we are uh, measuring memory before and after. And for the randomized control trial, we have um, an imaging battery uh, to do before and after to see whether the 12-week administration of oxytocin will give us any changes in either function or structure um, of the brain. And then our collaborator in Chicago, um, who has a lab that specializes in oxytocin, will look at blood levels, genes that are related to oxytocin, and gene expression of the genes that are related to oxytocin to see whether we can predict response, whether it's efficacy or um, side effect generation. So, this is where we are right now. Um, there's lots of work to be done in the system before it's really ready for classic drug, de drug development. Um, 
I showed you some work about blood levels, but the truth is there's no validated assay for measuring blood levels. So all, already this is complicated. We absolutely need a PET ligand. We need to see what the density of the receptors are in vivo in the brain and whatever we give to them, what the affinity of those compounds are for the receptors in the brain. We need to kind of deal with this half-life question. We don't know what it means. It seems to be almost irrelevant. And I was at a meeting in January where there was a suggestion that, in fact, it is irrelevant. So they were suggesting that what happens is but when you give oxytocin and it gets to the circumventricular organs at the blood-brain barrier, you induce central release. And so, in fact, you get your effects from central release of oxytocin and not from the compound that you actually gave, which is actually very interesting because if that's true, then there must be other ways to induce this phenomenon. And you may not have to give oxytocin to induce this phenomenon. So we have to figure it out. The small molecule analog story I already told you about, and then all this um, measurement issue that we have with social cognition. And I'm going to stop here. This is the Blue Review team. This is the Mount Sinai team. And all of this was kind of a huge group effort. Thank you.